Welcome back. Vaccine efforts remain a huge part of New York City's recovery, with vaccine outreach expanding to different communities throughout the city. Here to talk to us about the vulnerable community of patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities is Dr. Karen Bonick and Joanne F. Siegel, co-directors of the University Center of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and faculty in the Department of Pediatrics at Children's Hospital at Montefiore. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So we're just gonna jump right into it. According to your findings, patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities, also known as IDDs, are three times more likely to die from COVID than the general population. Can you just explain why this is such a vulnerable community? Yes, um, pre-existing health conditions such as a Down syndrome, obesity, cardiac and respiratory illness are uh, common factors and create complex medical um, issues for our population. So these conditions make them more vulnerable to getting the, uh, getting, uh, the, pan uh, the illness. Um, they have close contact, individuals have close contact with um, their caretakers. And, and many times individuals with IDD have difficulty with masking and social distancing. Um, a lot of adults in New York State live in congregate care settings, which also um, basically is a reason for um, the illness to spread. And so they were very vulnerable, particularly during the beginning of the pandemic in New York State. Um, and again, those, those living in group residences, many of them were older and had these complex um, medical conditions. Uh, now, Karen, can you explain why the ef what efforts Montefiore is making to address this health disparity? Sure. Well, um, we can highlight one of them, which is our Vax Vax DDNY grant, um, which was an effort really has multiple prongs. The first is partnering. We knew that in order to do this work, we had to reach reach out to the community. We couldn't do it alone. So, as you said, we were able to draw on our existing network. Uh, we had provider organizations under the Interagency Council, Special Olympics, and in addition, we developed new partners um, that serve the Chinese, Spanish, Korean, and South Asian uh, communities with disabilities. So that's number one. Number two is education. We've conducted uh, several town halls featuring physicians um, geared to both agency and staff across all of New York State. And perhaps the most successful of these town halls were actually given in small groups, um, to, let's say, Korean language, um, Chinese speakers. And I actually think that through some of them, we've changed some of their minds about their thoughts um, about the vaccine. And finally, the production and dem dissemination of original content. This has included videos, uh, social media outreach, et cetera. So partnering, education, and producing content. Now, can you explain you know, how this actually began? Was it a long process getting access to resources to create this initiative? Well, the, our, we have a large network of, of organizations that we partner with. And um, right from the beginning when the pandemic hit, because the numbers were so high in terms of people being affected by, um, by COVID-19, um, our partners came together and saw this as a, um, as a critical need. And we were lucky, um, we have our New York State Developmental Disabilities Planning Council who, um, responded to our request for funding to initiate this project, which, which focuses not only in the New York City region, but we also have outreach with our partners um, throughout the state of New York as well. So this was the first time that we were able to really come together very quickly to look at a problem and try to come up with some solutions on how to help people um, during this pandemic. Now, I noticed there was an effort to state that this is purely science-based information on COVID-19. Why was that important for your team? Well, I am, my, my primary hat is really a, a researcher by training. And so for me, I think that you must lead with science, you must lead with evidence and facts. Um, there is no shortage, as we all know, of misinformation out there. But we felt we needed to get credible sources to people who may not access them in a format that they can use. 
the Einstein Montefiore team, as you mentioned, is making uh, tailored messages and content for this community. What can viewers expect when they come across this content? Well, the, the first thing that we decided to do was to create webinars in multiple languages to reach um, decision makers in, in families. Um, and we, we noticed that in different uh, communities, the decision makers may not be necessarily the parent, they may be the grandparent, they may be um, a neighbor like who influences a family in terms of their decisions. So we decided to go with um, providing these webinars in multiple languages to focus on um, diverse communities. And so um, we also created um, videos with advocates and they could be um, family members who would talk about why they got the vaccine. They could be individuals with um, IDD who also got the vaccine. And so um, we wanted them to talk directly to, uh, to the families as to why they got the vaccine. Um, we also developed a um, social media channels, including Twitter and Facebook, in order to disseminate information. And um, that's how we, we're, we're reaching many of our um, individuals in, the, in our community. Now, why do you think there's so much skepticism around the vaccine? And what would you say to combat vaccine hesitancy? Well, first off, as I mentioned earlier, misinformation. A lot of people get information from their peers and not necessarily credible sources. Our goal is to share fact-based information in user-friendly languages in settings that people feel comfortable in. So as I noted earlier, in a town hall, let's say in, done in the Korean language, um, we have literally seen people change their minds in the course of an hour and a half programming. You've given them factual information in a small setting from a physician in their own language. So that is our role. You know, we also, unfortunately, we can't get away from the fact that both politics and fear play a part. And, you know, un unfortunately, viruses don't know any, just like they don't know regions or race or political affiliation. Um, you know, we, we really need to just keep with the facts and that's what drives us. Now, I like to focus on children for a minute. Do children with IDDs experience unique challenges, especially those who may not be of age to get the vaccine at this moment? Yes, we hear, we hear from a lot of families, their concerns um, for their sons and daughters who uh, are probably um, have complex needs, healthcare needs, but who also now are, would not necessarily be uh, eligible because of their age to the vaccine. So um, what we try to do is to um, work with our families and answer any questions that they may have. And we will be doing a whole series um, on children coming up uh, in November to address the concerns that families may have, the mental health concerns, as well as just typical vaccine um, questions that they may have. Um, also, what we're because what families are facing is a decision: do they send their children to school or not? Knowing that they may be exposed to uh, individuals who have not been vaccinated, and so um, children may have problems with wearing masks, and that may uh, that that have intellectual and developmental disabilities, and that puts them at greater risk for contracting the uh, COVID nineteen. So we are asking the adults. In their, in their community, teachers, family members, bus drivers, to keep our children safe and make sure that everyone follows protocols um, for mask wearing and vaccination. And um, so we're, we're very hopeful that children will be helped if they follow these uh, regulations and rules. Now, I understand that you mentioned, you know, wearing a mask can sometimes be a challenge for these children. What can we as adults or just, you know, people around these children also do to help protect them? Yeah, I think that, as Joanne said, adults and anyone who is eligible to get the vaccine should do so. Um, walk, don't run, but, but go and get the, you know, the vaccine. Keep social distancing and keep wearing masks because uh, some of these children or even adults who have significant sensory issues just cannot tolerate a mask. So as, as 
was said earlier, you know, we all have to sort of pitch in to keep the people in our community safe and those who are most at risk. That is our responsibility to keep them safe. So vaccines, masks, and distances as recommended. Um, and how can people utilize the resources Montefiore has available at this moment? So we encourage people to follow us at uh, on Twitter at VaxFaxDDNY. And you can also visit our UCED, U-C-E-D-D landing page at Einstein. And again, if you type in VaxFaxDDNY on our website, our information will come up. Perfect. Once again, I'd like to thank you both for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. That's all for our show today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Kevin Aline, wishing you and yours safety and wellness now and always. See you next time.